Hello everyone. Nice to see you all again and welcome if you've never been before. Um, and it's about time you came if you've never been before because this is the last in a series of uh, 10 lectures in this series of Auslit at the Wheeler Centre for Books, Writing and Ideas. Um, I'm Ramona Koval and it's been my great pleasure to be introducing you to these lectures on some of their most important texts in Australian literature. Tonight's book is That Dead Man Dance by Western Australian writer Kim Scott, uh, winner of the 2011 Miles Franklin Award, the 2011 Regional Commonwealth Writers' Prize, the 2011 ALS Gold Medal and the Kate Chalice Racker Award, and the 2011 Victorian Prize for Literature and the 2011 Victorian Premier's Literary Award as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> When it was published, the Australian Book Review had Kim Scott uh, on the cover under the banner The Return of Kim Scott uh, because it had been 10 years since he was joint winner of the Miles Franklin Award in 2000. With, uh, he, was, he shared it with Thea Astley's Drylands for his novel Benang. That book was the first one that I'd read of his and it was the first time I spoke to him when, um, when it was published. It was narrated by Harley, a Noongar man, who is the outwardly successful outcome of his white grandfather's attempts to put in practice the racial theories of the infamous A.O. Neville. A.O. Neville was Western Australian Chief Protector of Aborigines and before that Chief of the Department for the North West Aborigines and Fisheries. Neville argued that the breeding out of colour by careful control of part Aboriginal people, where they lived, who they married, would ultimately lead to the day where we could forget there were Aborigines in Australia. It was a very strong novel, it was very moving, and it was stark and it was poetic, that story of a young man who has to carry his brutal but failing grandfather on his back, weighed down by history and family obligations taught to him by his Aboriginal relatives. And when he put his grandfather down on the ground, he began to float away, weightless in his lack of a sense of who he is. That Dead Man Dance is again set in the West, but in this book, Kim Scott ranges even further back into history and the first few decades of British settlement on the southwestern Australian coast. We meet a young Noongar man, Bobby Wabalingini, who makes friends with the new arrivals, and indeed, the place where they meet is called the Friendly Frontier. Bobby, for that's his name, is very curious about these new arrivals who were prepared to pay the rent, as it were, and to share their own cultural products with the Nyunga people. But it doesn't last. When I spoke with Kim Scott on the occasion of the book's publication, I said that I thought um, about the friendliness of the coast or otherwise being sometimes really dependent on the personalities of the people who meet rather than necessarily the politics of the situation. I mean, if the first British guy hadn't been a bit open and if the Bobby character hadn't been open as well, if they'd just been two different people, might it had been a different story. Um, Kim Scott says, possibly Ramona, because he's a very, very polite man, <laughs> but he was going to disagree with me. He said, certainly personalities always are a large part of it, but this is what he said. I think it's possible to talk a little bit about how culture infor informs personality and prioritises certain values or makes certain sorts of behaviour more likely and indeed possible. And it seems to me, he said, of course I'm biased, it seems to me that Nyunga culture has, and certainly in these historical encounters you see it very readily, has a great propensity to share or allow individuals like that to be. And and so confident of who they are and where they are that allows them to make allowances and to accommodate the other in these sorts of encounters. 
Our lecturer this evening is Philip Morrissey, who's a long-standing reader and admirer of Kim Scott. Philip teaches a number of Kim Scott's novels as part of courses that form the Indigenous Studies major at the University of Melbourne, and he's the academic coordinator of the Faculty of Arts Australian Indigenous Studies program um, at the University of Melbourne. He's also an organiser of a colloquium on Kim Scott's writings to be held at Melbourne University in August and the organiser of a special lecture that Kim Scott himself is going to give uh, in July. Um, please uh, make Philip Morrissey welcome tonight. Thank you, Ramona, and welcome, everyone. Uh, before I begin, I want to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, uh, their ownership of this land where we're having this tonight, and also pay my respects to the elders, past and present. A lot of bad things have been done here. We won't speak of them now, my friends, but that was a good beginning. Uh, so speaks Bobby Wobblingi in that dead man dance. And I want to get to this point, the bad things that were done, the good beginning, and possibly how Kim Scott, the novelist, and also the, the linguistic activist, sees maybe a new beginning. And I want to go through a couple of things because I think with Kim, if you're reading Dead Man Dance, um, I'd really suggest you also engage in a project of reading all his work um, because I believe there are continuities and continual um, continuities, but also a, a continual interest in certain things in Kim's work. I just wanted to actually give a little bit of background. And the first novel, and one which is my favourite and has always remained my favourite, is a book called True Country, published in 1992. And it certainly came in under the radar, so to speak. Um, I'd heard of Kim Scott and a, another person I respected thought he might be a really major writer. At this time, there was a lot of controversy about Aboriginal writers and who was Aboriginal and who wasn't. I'd actually asked, is Kim Scott Aboriginal? And the word came back from Western Australia, yes, he is. So that was the environment which it came out. Published in 1992, a politically radical work, radical in its independence from the discourse and assumptions of the actual politics and governance of the day. It was remarkable for the clarity of its representation and analytic discussion of the forms and discourses, Aboriginal politics, governance and social problems had developed under the federal Labor government in the early 1990s. So this was a novel written by an unknown novelist, which to me seemed to be so honest, so truthful, but also so full of hope and optimism for Indigenous people. It was saying things no one else was saying publicly in advance of so-called public intellectuals and politicians. And I want to suggest that his method has remained consistent. He draws on a range of archival facts, but also he includes Indigenous knowledges, and he makes qualitative choices as to the manner in which they'll be used. He's not simply a retailer of facts. And my view of a book like Benang, it is a complex book because Australia's history is complex, the facts are complex, but to me it's the greatest exposition of what the eugenics program of the stolen generation as implemented by A.O. Neville actually meant for individuals, for Aboriginals. And I know there have been some very good histories, but nothing compares to Benang. And of this, uh, the, the writer Jan Kapita says, Benung is our history written like a mirage. Yet as we are drawn into it, we realise it is no mirage. And we might want to think about that in relation to that dead man dance. I know a number of readers, of course, have felt themselves absorbed into this novel uh, very easily. Now, as well as sort of the facts of our history, He's also very much concerned with texture, and I think this is really important in a novelist. We want actual specificities. We want the details. We want the taste of things, the feel of things. And it's these events as realities that constitute Aboriginal people as subjects, but also constitute non-Aboriginal people as subjects. What does it make, what are the things that make us who we are? What are the experiences that make us individuals? And of course, that dead man dance, um, it's a book of friendship, very touching representations of friendship, of betrayal, but also this takes place in a magnificent landscape of sky and sea and rain, of ochre, smells of ochre, resin, rainstorms. 
the immediacy of the environment for that early settlement. Prior to, I guess, the point where you know, European settlers were able to sort of move away from it to actually construct buildings to keep it out. And I want to suggest it's through these bases that he, Kim Scott describes and questions colonial knowledges, languages and practices. And I'm going to quote, quote an, uh, an Indigenous scholar, Martin Nakata, who, who writes, the world of prejudice and exclusion, cultural and material within which the island and the Aboriginal live is, is not described. I repeat, it's as if our culture wasn't and isn't being suppressed. We just lost it. The question of how we actually position daily in relation to colonial knowledges, languages and practices in the material world remains unasked. Now, I think the great thing about a Kim Scott novel is as well as giving the texture, the great characters, the forms of identification, the environment, there is an intellectual project of disclosing those unacknowledged assumptions and knowledges which underlie our understanding of the Indigenous world, of the Indigenous settler contact. So, you know, that Dead Man Dance, of course, is a book um, which I feel in my first reading I didn't do justice to. I've now returned. I'm actually fascinated by a couple of passages, and it's the, mo the mode I'm going to be reading it for a while. It's actually, uh, having spoken to Kim, having learned a little bit about his project, but also starting to respond on a very personal level to elements of it. And I hope to read some of those um, passages later on to this evening. Just the other thing with Kim, if you, of course, and it's quite obvious in Dead Man Dance, it's there in True Country and in ben Benang, is his attention to language. And it's an attention which normally is associated with the poet. And this attention is to find a language which, in a sense, disrupts in, a, in an elegant and aesthetic way but disrupts the sort of the, the, the forms and patterns that sort of hide the reality of Aboriginal settler relations in our histories. He's disrupting that. Now, on another level, Kim Scott, the linguistic activist, the cultural activist, is also deeply involved in the regeneration of the Nyungar language. So that, I think, having spoken to him, is as important as a project as the work he's doing in that Dead Man Dance. That Dead Man Dance, of course, contains passages which were written in the Nyungar language by Kim and then translated in English. So the sometimes interesting syntax, the challenging syntax, is actually his own experimentation with forms of English inflected by the Nyungar language. And of course, the Dead Man Dent Dance is a great book of cultural exchange. People exchange in the early parts of settlement. The indigenous people are wanting to learn, wanting to exchange, and there's quite a continuous ritual of the Nyungar men exchanging kangaroo cloaks or attempting to exchange them with the, the non-Indigenous non settlers, colonists, call them what we will. Kim himself, of course, has spoken about the English language and he said that he, he's, he's trying to produce a way of writing without new ageism, or sentimentality getting in the way. So this project, I think, coming to a fruition in that Dead Man Dance. Another important element, which I think gives its book its particular intensity, is that in a Kim Scott novel, the human subject is the point where truth can be known, lived. And I want to suggest they're also mutually evoked. The reader plays a role in producing those truths. They're in a sense intransitive. They're not given to you as simple facts. You, as a reader, will work to produce the truth. And that's why the book can have a compelling individual effect for certain people if you are part of that process. Now, I just want to re return to, I guess, the, the points of the text which I find compelling. And the two figures, Dr. Cross, who's dying of tuberculosis, and Wunyarin. Now, it's a tragic sort of friendship. Dr. Cross is killing his friends. He's the settler who most is open to in the Noongar people. But at the same time, he 
you would see is the cause of their death. And Wunjirin is the young man who's open, gifted. Um, it's said that he has a certain charm, an easy, soft laugh that was like an arm gently pulling you close, who is also the mediator who's interested in the settlers. He becomes almost Dr. Cross's first victim. Now, what I find compelling in the novel is the way that Kim Scott shows this transition, this slow transition, which is starting to come to fruition in the lives of the two friends. And this is a book of that friendship. And we will then see in the novel how there's almost a betrayal of that. The two friends die shortly after each other. They're buried together in expression with, 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 um, following Dr. Cross's wish. They're actually seen in the future in a grave together by Bobby when he's lifted high and is floating as a small boy. He has a, believes, as an old man, he believes he was able to see into the future and see the two bodies lying together. Now we see that disrupted as the new narrative of settlement takes place. The bodies, uh, Dr. Cross is disinterred, Wunyaran's body is simply desecrated, and then we end with the flat inscription of, you know, Dr. Cross, settler, etc., etc., etc. And that inscription, of course, possibly stands for the histories which you find all over Australia, the local histories. What was left out, what could have been as well. So an incredibly moving two pages on 61, 62 or 63 of the text I've got. It's about Dr. Cross and it's almost like the realisation of failure. Um, but also a real, the realisation on some level that his, his own illness will kill him. The vision of actually bringing his family to Australia is not going to happen. And he's lost a certain sort of, you know, belief in the project. If I should die, he told Chain, bury me with Wunyurin. And were that to happen, he'd arrange a chain by his land. They agreed on a price, so that at least Cross's own wife and children might benefit. For someone must benefit from this enterprise, this grabbing and selling of land. Cross had thought to be part of a new kind of society, but his wife and children would be better off to never go aboard a ship. And if it was too late for that, to turn around and sail home at their first chance, sail back to money in the bank and away from here. He was not strong enough for this. The trees in the misty rain looked like drawings, trunks and limbs darkly shaded one side and their leafy drooping heads dissolving at the edges. Cross drifted, buoyed by the rain and moved by currents as if the heavy damp air was in fact ocean. He was far beneath the surface and did not know from, up from down as darkness moved in, moved in around him. The sound of his coughing was very distant and faint, although his body continued to shake with each loud, plodding heartbeat. So this early admission of failure, and it's, I think, one of the things I find so powerful in this book is the way that Scott is able to just show in the lives of individuals this change. The world is changing. For Scott, it's a way, I think, of actually saying, maybe this marks an end. Something went wrong. A lot of that bad things have been done here. We won't speak of them now, but we will speak. It was a good beginning. What is the way back to that? And my, uh, the, 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 the chapter I've actually been thinking a lot about and had a chance to talk to Kim about is just titled Tongue and Paper. It's, it features Wunyurin, and he's simply doing something as every day for an Indigenous person of time is actually um, spearing fish. But a series of reflections start to emerge as he does that, and the world is different. He's become a different person as a result of his contact with the settlers. And it's a prelude to his eventual death. And there's a certain sort of disconnection that the Bunyaran actually has from his own bodies and experience. So there's a new element in Aboriginal life where once he would have been totally at one with that environment, that experience, he started to observe himself. He observes his feet, in the, his legs in the water. He sees the landscape differently. 
So I'll read the first paragraph. As he waded in the warm shallows at the south side of the harbour, each of Wunyarin's shins momentarily became like the bow of a boat pushing a tiny way before it, or the point of a spearhead. As his weight shifted onto the foot, the water eddied, and suddenly there was no wave, no bow, no spearhead. He stopped, wriggled his toes, and sank deeper into the sand. Calves, ankles, and feet were slightly to one side of where they should be. Below and above the sea's skin did not quite match. As if there were two people, not quite the same, one visible only below water, one visible above. These legs so dark and thin might be spears, oars, gun barrels even. So that sort of fractured consciousness which has started to emerge in this incredibly gifted man as a result of the connection with the Europeans. And there is a debate amongst the Indigenous people, particularly in Western Australia and the Nyunga community, about cultural exchange. Is it good or is it bad? This book, of course, suggests it is good. Nyunga people were reaching out and wanting to learn. It had to go both ways, of course. There is a, a, an argument that cultural exchange will always lead to loss for Indigenous people. We will lose more than we gain. It's, again, it's called, it's like the, I think, it's like the spider and the fly in the web, that the spider will always end up eating the fly, even if they appear to start off from a position of equivalence. And I think even as Scott believes in exchange, he's also showing you know, what the deficits are. So it goes on, and this sort of fractured consciousness is sort of continually being manifested in relation to the landscape. It talks of um, his interest in writing. He had begun to collect leaf, feather, bone, and pressing some of them between sheets of paper to mark the days by them. Why? Why? He's making pressings. Why is he doing this? How has this entered into his life? He looks into the distant smoke way up there, someone hunting along the ridge between him and the open southern ocean. More wind up there, and his brothers would be poised at the edge of tendrils and thick loops of smoke, the fire roaring and crackling in the scrub, the bodies crashing, rushing to meet their spears. And why he not with them? So a traditional hunt is underway, and this fire, use of fire, of course, is not a crude use of fire to flush game out. It actually is a form of harvesting. The game will be in a certain place at a certain time. The grass will be ready to fire. So he's observing that hunt from a distance. Scott writes on, but the sand could no more record his passing, then could the water, the air, or clouds, his footprints disappeared. And these words, the words that the author writes, hold barely a trace of Wunyarin's voice. Yet so much of the others who came as strangers and were surprised more than once at what marks could be found and what could be realised from them. Just as no mark of his passing remains in the water, so there remains little trace of his tongue in the air or these hills around him and sky, these clouds. But surely if we pause, listen long enough. So these words hold barely a trace of Winneran's voice, yet so much for the others who came as strangers. And this interest of Scott in actually the necessity to speak, to write, and he makes this point in his first novel, True Country. We have to speak, we have to write, because if we don't, it's the others. And that's not necessarily racial as well. He talks about the the other, the discourses with their sort of jackboots and their sort of crunching power, that even if you aren't the majority, even if you're only the individual, you must speak and write. So these sort of elegiac moments are sort of the, the almost the high points in the novel because they still mark the friendship, the attempted understanding between Cross and Winneran. And I think the profundity here is actually, you know, we might think it's simply a matter of actually being friends and shaking hands. It actually becomes more complex. Um, different worldviews, different different modes of being. How can uh, a European person, a product of a certain relation to the world, the representative of a group of people who many years before 
had turned away from the life that Indigenous people still live, what can you bring that won't infect that culture? And on a personal level, on the level of the body with your germs and diseases, on the level of your overt ideas about religion. And there's another very profound sort of set of passages, of course, where Cross and when you're in talk about the different belief systems, when you're in tries to explain a sort of cos cosmology of s stars and sky, Dr. Cross passionately tries to explain the precepts of a Christian belief system. When you're listens patiently and then taps him on the shoulder and basically says, you're in the wrong port now, doctor. You know. So the world starts to change then more overtly. The, you know, a governor arrives, Bobby realised that King Georgetown is a growing village. Um, there's a re-narrativisation, there's also simplification. The Nyunga are no longer referred to as a Nyunga, they're simply black fellas and white fellas. So this is the, the digging up, the reinterring of Dr. Cross and the desecration of Wunyurin's grave. None of Wunyurin's people were present when Cross's decaying coffin body was reburied in the Newtown Cemetery, not far from the great granite boulders near where Bobby had once rescued Skelly. Skelly's bowed head was one of those around the patch of earth where Dr. Cross's coffin was laid and which was marked not by not just a cross, but a railing and a headstone engraved. Dr. Cross, 1781, 1833, surgeon, pioneer and landowner, 1826, 1833, King Georgetown, Western Australia. It seems Geordie Chain and Governor, Governor Spender had for once agreed this was more appropriate to Cross's important role in the history of King Georgetown. The original still raw grey was hastily filled. A town dog scurried away with something in its jaws. A cat hunching its back showed its teeth but would not be moved. Small bones were left to grey in the sun, etc. It's an interesting book for Kim because it's really it's very accessible in some ways, but it's also it's the one book which actually ends on a very open, almost pessimistic note. In true country, it ends with Billy, the protagonist, having a vision and seeing the world from the perspective of the, the omniscient narrators, the Aboriginal elders who are the sort of narrators that see things. And it concludes with the words, you know, we've got to be singing our country a little bit better, a little bit new each day. Otherwise, you're on a downward sort of track. Benang, which is a very confronting, um, tough book, ends on a very strong affirmative mark, Benang, we are here. We've survived, we are here. This one, of course, ends with Bobby's dance, which uh, he, he, he does, and I guess it's, he, he does with a view, of course, that he can heal the, the past, the rift between settler and Aboriginal. And this image Kim Scott uses, of course, is a bit like Colin Johnson's or Mudrew's Dr. Reddy's prescription. Sorry, I'm getting the wrong word. The Colin Mudrew's The Master of the Ghost Dreaming, where the shaman, Junga Matrak, believes he can perform a ceremony to heal the settlers, the ghosts, as well as the Aboriginal people. But once again, there's this sort of alienation where the unsympathetic observers seem to emerge all of a sudden. Suddenly he felt not fear, but a terrible anxiety faces other than those of Jack Tar and Binyon had turned away from him. Bobby felt as if he had surfaced in some other world. Chairs creaked as people stirred, coughing. Chain led them to their feet. Fingers at the periphery of Bobby's vision fell away. He heard gunshots and another sound, a little dog yelping. So I think it's a book which we still haven't really taken the measure of. Um, I think it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Aboriginal writers and need to be validated. The Miles Franklin Award, of course, is a very powerful way of doing that. Um, 
Kim will be back across here on the 25th of July and he'll give an oration at the University of Melbourne and we want him to make the point, of course, this is a major writer, we want to honour him. So it's going to be a special event and then we've got a colloquium on the 3rd and 4th of August which will actually be, be Kim Scott's novels as well. And we've essentially got almost everyone who's written a substantial article on Kim, they've all sort of been really enthused and you know, revisiting their work or writing new material for that colloquium as well. So I've concluded my part, Ramona. All right, come and sit down then. Thank you. Well, as you know, the practice has been that there are people with mics and they'll be on either side of this group. And when you're ready to ask a question, you've got to put your hand up. Just before I take the first question, I, I wanted to talk about... Um, I mean, the Settler Diaries are available um, in, in libraries and the way Kim has reconstituted or re reconstructed the Noongar experience um, is uh, a kind of exemplary story of archival work. Could you talk a little bit about that, about what he did or, or what was available for him to do? I probably can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there are songs, and, and, and this is part of his interest in language, isn't it? Absolutely, um, yes. I mean, because it's the, that dead man dance is his view of the um, sort of march to arms mm. or that, that he could see these guys doing in their red and white uniforms. Yeah. Um, but he, Kim also found little snatches of English in Nyunga songs that he he discovered. That's right. And mm. wondering what they're doing there. And I mean, that was a sort of an indication to him that the people who took those phrases and put them in their songs and then taught them to their children and taught them to their children, were that was evidence mm. of them taking, do, of an exchange, a cultural yeah. exchange. Kim's thesis when I spoke to him was that actually for the Nyunga people, it was quite natural that people should appear in boats and across the sea. It wasn't strange and they were open to learning this new experience. And of course, the figure of Wunyarun is based on a historical figure called Makari, and where he sings that snatches of some folk ballad, and the soldier is surprised because an Aboriginal person has got it down perfectly. It, it's an historical incident as well. And there was also a, a, a person in a historical character that was discovered speaking perfect French, an Aboriginal person speaking French mm. because the French had been there previously and he'd had something to do with them. And then there's a sort of the whale, the whales in this book. Um, when, I, when I first read it, I think I made a little note saying it's, it's like a, um, um, an Australian uh, Moby Dick in a way. You know, and I think he did read Moby Dick, but he also is is thinking about Noongar stories about whales as well, and sort of combining everything he knows in his way of melding mm. his his traditional knowledge and what what he's gleaned from the archives with his literary education. What what about your, your sense of him as as a poet. Could, could you talk a little bit about his poetic language and how that affects you? Well, his great predecessor, Woodrow, really hated English. And she said she did even. There was sort of like a sense of loss. She was forced to speak in this language of the coloniser, which is a, the discourse of the time. Um, Kim's perspective is really interesting, I think, because the true country, I think, really breaks new ground for a national writer in terms of the language he uses, but also the way he positions each of his characters. There's no sort of overriding narrative of presence. There are a number of narratives, plural narratives. And there's a mastery of also of Aboriginal Englishes, of Creole as well. So that real sensitivity of language, which marks also the work of someone like Jack Davis, is there. And it's, it's, to me, it actually gives you access to a multiplicity of subjectivities. I'm really interested in how do individuals live out this moment in history in which they find themselves? And it's when you actually encounter that personage in a text, it's that intensity which is a reading experience for me. It's reading a novel which gives you that. I don't want to waste my time, you know, reading a lot of boring histories when I can actually understand the realities of the eugenics project of A.O. Neville, 
of its effect on Aboriginal people through reading Benung and to see the intricacies of, of you know of human response to that. Likewise, here yeah, I, I um, the, the figures like Winyarin, Bobby, how are individual Aboriginal people responding to this moment? And the thing about archival research, of course, Kim is disciplined. He thinks not in a total free form manner. He will think within certain indicated parameters from his archival research. But having done that, he's a creative artist. He's not there to simply write a fictional narrative, narrative based on facts. It's the genius of Kim Scott that's got to do something more. And I think the, the thing with language, of course, it's really, it's also about thinking. If we use language in a banal sense where we never have to actually problematise it, the poet really wants to disrupt that. He actually wants, or she wants us, to think about language and reality. Kim Scott does that. And that's why he also doesn't deal in platitudes. He's not going to tell you simple things to believe. And people who reach for that in a, in a Kim Scott novel aren't going to get it. It doesn't stop people, of course, using a framework, you know, a banal framework to try to understand his work and writing articles about it. <laughs> what, what has, what has, has, has there been a critique of, of Kim Scott um, in the Noongar community? Has, has there been a critique that says, you know, this is about you know how it was friendly and the possibilities for friendliness and it, has it, has he been seen as naive? No. Uh, well, firstly, I think that obviously community relations are incredibly complex, and I really respect Kim in the manner in which he's actually able to work with community, and that's a really complex term to be part of a, a, a project to regenerate Noongar language. That is, that is an incredibly difficult task to actually for him as a writer to position himself to be able to do that. There would be people, I'm sure, who would reject the thesis. And as I say, I've, I've seen a very powerful thesis, counter thesis enunciated, which says, basically summed up in the terms, Junga mean your woman girl, the smell of the white man is killing us. Those clothes which you're exchanging with them stink. Don't put them on. The stink will stay on your body. Um, this notion of exchange has actually been interpreted by some younger people as actually a negative. And in, and in the book, yeah, there's so much um, exchange of clothing goes on all through the book. Um, and he, he writes about um, people being able to smell each other mm. in the clothing, sort of in, in that fundamental human-to-human -human relationship of smell and closeness. Yes, and... Um the, the notion of friendship, and obviously you're going to have this custom which probably seems a little bit odd if you like someone, you embrace them and lift them off their feet and spin them around. And, um, but the clothing is really important. But also I think what's interesting to me is also this moment, who are the people who are representing what civilization should be? It's in Yunga. They're healthy. They're, the way they live is totally attuned to the landscape. With and they're the, confident in it. They're confident in it. Who are the people who are unhappy, you know, carrying diseases? It's the, the settlers. They're far away from home. Mm. And possibly far away from their origins. You know, the, the real challenge is, did non-Indigenous societies make a big mistake? What about some questions from this erudite audience? Yes, Madam in the front row. Do we, we, got, we need a mic here? Oh. Just, just hang on a second. You have to have the mic. That's the rule. I feel other people will um, be interested in this question. I hope so. Can you throw some light on the title, That Dead Man Dance? It's, I've been in a book group where no one agreed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Ramona, you've got a line uh, on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. When, when I read it, it was like, um, it was the dead man dance. It, it was about having... They were they were report what are they report to arms or something like that it's called where they, mm. yeah, they're marching along and then they're well, they're doing things with the mm. the the guns what do they do that what is that called um, drill. what's it called it's a drill a drill yeah that's right so he sees these people and they're sort of marching and they're doing weird things with their and they probably see he probably sees that and that you can kill people with that as well mm. um, so. Or a dead man uh, that he's a ghost coming back. 
um, and that's the white the white ghosts, and these are the dead men. So, um, as with, um, I mean, Kim Scott is always complicated about everything, about the mm. titles he gives things and the names he gives p- names he gives people. So, um, I think anyway, that's my take on it. What do you reckon? Yeah, I agree. It's it's probably a reference to the soldiers as the ghosts or the spirits who are returning, which is common in you know most contact narratives. And they dance, which is, is a dance unlike the, the like of which they've never seen. The, and for them, the dance yeah. is different from that. They yeah. imagine this is what that the men are dancing, the white men are dancing and, mm. and invoking something. That's right. He can't imagine what it is he, they're in, in, invoking, but he believes that it must be like me. We would do dances about this and that. They're doing mm. this dance, which he models and. And he does, and, and, he's, and he means it as a sort of an honouring of the guests. And it turns into a, um, you know, he's a, he's, he turns into a figure of fun, doesn't he? Hmm. An entertainment. That's right, yeah. What did your book group think? Well, oh, hang on, you can't speak. Come on, ladies, <laughs> run. <laughs> <laughs> no, you just have to, nobody will be able to hear you if you don't use well, Yes, I guess the use of the word that, you know, that dead man dance. There's that dead man dance. That oh, you know that dead man dance. You know that song. Well, why is that difficult? Why is we found it difficult? Some of us. Okay. <laughs> All it's right. Use the word that. That okay. Anyone else got any views? Up the back. Yes, there's somebody there with a. I just have a really quick question. Um, where is Signet River in today's? towns in Western Australia. Do you know? No. No. I thought it was Swan River. Do you? Swan River. We think it's, oh, Signet. Maybe it's a little Swan River. So just to return to the title thing, um, I'm in a queue, a very long queue at my library to get the book. (laughs) So I've already formed, I already had a sort of um, notion of what it meant, which is totally based on um, the idea of the hangman's the, uh, uh, the dead man dance to me is the dance done by a hanged man. Oh. And so that's the association I had for it. And, and what, where does that come from? Just because I think it's, it's already a, in literature, you know, that dead man dance is hanging, you know, and if it f- connects with what you've been saying, it oh. has a sense of the mistake that Mr. Morrissey referred to in, that Indigenous make people made in um, being welcoming because they've kind of signed their own death warrant. Mm. That's, that's, that's another, well that is an that element. That was the connection yeah. I sort of made when he said that. <laughs> yes? Yeah, on the same topic, I had a notion that um, it was ironic that um, when the gunshots sounded out in the final passage of the book that maybe Bobby was a dead man. So it's, yeah, that was my sort of thoughts. That things weren't, Bobby wasn't long for this earth um, when he was doing the dance at the end of, of the book. Did, did you think it was, it, how did it end for you? I mean, did you, did you feel that the, the book was uh, uplifting or did it make you feel? Oh no, I felt really empty when I read the book. I thought, it, um, yeah, the sounds of the gun, gunshots were, a terrible prophecy of what was to come. I imagined something quite dark for the future of the civilization, and particularly Bobby. What do you think Kim would have wanted? There's nothing clear about Kim's writing, and <laughs> that's the the pleasure of it. It's actually not a linear sort of narrative uh, in that sense, and um, in true country. Does the protagonist die or not die? Kim says he he wanted him to live on and to produce a future, um, but he's he's not going to reject the other reading. And similarly, I know people who believe Bobby died very early in, on in the novel, and actually it's his spirit that's <laughs> very appearing. And I don't think Kim would actually contest that as well. It's um, you know, we're not going to lock down things to very precise and specific meanings. It's 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 poetry. It's a novel. There are some broad general truths we should be taking from it. There are things which we'll share with other people. There are things which will be personal truths. 
but it, it's not a puzzle to sort of say what did the author mean here, what's this mean? I, I don't think that's an, an enriching way to deal with the text. Mm. What about some more questions? This side hasn't actually done their bit. Yes, at the front here. Hi. Um, something that I, is this kind of a comment, and maybe you can talk about it, um, that struck me was that towards the end when Bobby's trying to tell his story over and over again as an adult, um, I think that Kim Scott demonstrates that, you know, we've been through this whole journey with Bobby where we grow to understand his knowledge and all he's been through and this kind of intensely sophisticated understanding of the world and then at the end of the book when he's trying to tell his story it's almost like Kim Scott is demonstrating that Bob, Bobby comes across as very naive and yet we understand that he isn't he isn't naive in wanting to tell this story and nothing about his knowledge is naive and it's almost like we've created this world in which he can only be seen as naive in trying to tell his story um, and that's something that really struck me that um, as an adult, Bobby is cast as a particular, almost as a caricature, um, and that we're not able to understand. And yeah, I think that that says a lot about the world that we now live in. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a, a good point. He's an abject figure, isolated, marginal. There's a place for him, and he can tell these stories. But what sort of stories can he tell, and in what form can they be received? And of course, it, it's a dilemma of the Aboriginal writer as well. What sort of stories can you tell? Who will receive them? And to get back to my point, I think why I love Kim's work so much is actually he never tells you the story you think you should receive. He's always, and he wants you to be part of the making of that story. You know, I think that's really important. There is no one meaning. You have to produce that meaning in your reading for yourself as well. But of course, I mean, a story depends to tell and also on who's listening and how people listen. And um, early on in the book and with Dr Cross, the, you have a listener, you have someone who's alive to it and wants to understand. And then you have, at the end, this sort of people who think they know the story or they're on a different story now. So I, I think that that's reflected in, in, in what, you, what you're describing. <laughs> What about time? Time is really complex in the in the book. Um, you know, where are we beginning? Where have we got to? Are we are we back? Are we forward? I mean, you're smiling. You... <laughs> That's one of the dimensions of the text I'm still grappling with. Yeah. So, um, for me, and to try to understand the text, and one of the great things about the cloakroom, there'll be other readers of it who'll have perspectives, and they'll be shared. But. Um, it's still one, one of the elements of the text I'm working at. I'm actually picking on the parts that actually seem to have some sort of real affinity with and exploring those. And the passages that I read out, read out are profoundly philosophical. They say so much as well. Uh, the question of time also is equally interesting and another project for a reader to actually start to think about that. Not so much to work out, you know, to try to reduce that to a linear progression of time, but what does it actually mean? And the, we find this in Kim's works. Um, there are sort of puzzles there, and we can spend a lot of time trying to work out what he actually means. But there are some very profound truths which are personal, others which are shared, and I think that's, that's what he's doing. When I spoke to Kim when he was here last year, which was great to spend a bit of time with him, and I, was really, I really admired the fact that as, as an author, and I suppose many authors like this, he's incredibly patient with his readers. He gives you time to catch up. You know, like um, he's very understanding. If you actually he finds you understand something, he's very generous in adding a bit more. But he's actually he doesn't give you the keys to his text. It's a personal journey. Of course, if you ask, this is what I asked him. I said, time moves back in this novel, backwards and forwards. How did you decide the when and the how to go backwards and forwards in time? Where to start and when to go backwards and where to go forwards too. And he said, oh, I'd have to leaf through the book now to make sure what I ended up with. Um, I suppose I'm a little bit wary of chronology on its own. 
especially in the shared history stories, because it seems sort of wrong somehow to be starting with the arrival of the coloniser, because there's a much deeper and longer story. So I want to suggest that all the, that all the time, and one of the ways to do it, it seems to me, is through rhythm, really. But also in this particular story, this novel, I start a couple of times really with the Nyunga character, Bobby, on the ocean or on a ship. And I did that intuitively. And when I read it, I thought, oh, no, I can't do this. This is one of the tropes of colonisation, I think, people on ships and empire. But the more I thought about it, the more I liked it and the more I played with it because it was a way perhaps of showing the rhythm in Bobby's life. The rhythm of a boat moving on the ocean is part of something he tries to work out. And he has an affinity with the ocean, as new our people on the south coast still do have. So those decisions are largely intuitive, I must say. And when I said, and poetic by the sound of it, the way he speaks about the, the, um, the ocean, and he says, those things go together. And there was also the other thing that I'm trying to work with a little bit on the novel, I think, one of the working titles was Sounding the Whale, which was sort of a pun on the way sounding a whale, the great maritime mammal, just before it reaches the surface. And you can see the membrane of the sea about to bubble up as it emerges. And of course, sounding the whale being some sort of inarticulate cry of anguish, which is sort of in the background a bit in this novel as well, I think, about the damage done since this time of great possibility, about the loss since this time of possibility I was trying to story about. Um, and that sort of use of the word to story, he's, he's not saying I'm telling a story, he's actually in the story. And he, story is a verb mm. for him. Yeah, in the front here. Um, I was really interested in what you said about some parts of the novel where he put those parts into Noongar language and translated them back because um, I imagine trying to tell Noongar story in a foreign language is quite difficult. Can you tell us some more about, um, you said, talked about recapturing the Noongar language as well? Because it seems to me that's really important in telling the story, otherwise you're always telling that story in what's essentially a second language or a foreign language. Yeah, but you know that that is the, the, the dilemma. What other language do many Nunga speak but English, and there are inflections. There, you know, it's been said there's no such thing as English as such. There are many Englishes and inflections, and a major writer like Kim Scott, you know, the the attention that each individual subject will speak a specific form of English is there. Um, on a wider level, of course, he does see language regeneration as actually it could be done locally in clan language groups all over Australia and it could be a, you know, another way of actually recreating an ethical form of exchange with people learning the Noongar language or the Wurundjeri language you know, as, a, as a practical form of actually moving relations between Aboriginal and settler people forward as well. Um, what you say is very important but and it was debated a lot in the, in the, in the 1980s and um, sometimes the word was used cultural transvestism where you actually have to put on the garments of the other to represent yourself, um, but then you know the impossibility of not writing or the need to write. So what do you do? And it, I think it, it actually can be a real plus for a creator, a, a major writer, actually to grapple with that, even as he tells a story, or as Ramona says, Kim says, as he stories. But of course, he was educated as as an English teacher. He was worked as an English teacher, so. Um, Kim Scott is steeped in English, and it's his, you know, his joy, and it's and, he, and he's, you know, a master of it. Absolutely, that's really important because I think before Kim and Alexis, you know, were recognised as Miles Franklin Award winners, there was always a sense that Aboriginal writers had to be naive writers. They spoke from the heart, just of their own experience. They didn't read other authors, and. Plainly, we have to now get rid of that idea, you know, when we can see plainly they're influenced by a range of authors. Some we recognise, some, some we don't, but they're part of a larger community, which is literature.
Any other questions, queries, comments? You know, one at the back? Do you want to leave your hand up so we can just see where you were in this C? Hi. I found the passages about uh, Jeffrey and James to be really amongst the most powerful of the book, and I wondered if you could speak about their role in the novel a little bit. Yeah, they're incredibly confronting, and it's, 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 it's difficult for me as a reader sometimes to work out what the authorial perspective is there. They're, um, in a way, their victimage is such, it doesn't parallel the Aboriginal victimage, the, the way the Noongar people have been tra are going to be treated. And it's an alternative black history, and I, I don't know, I just find it very, you said powerful, I find it troubling that um, they intervene in Australian history, their blackness is obviously the, the critical way in the way that you know, they're treated. Um, they're part of, once again, a, a sort of failed project, a little bit whimsical, a bit like the project of Ernest Scat in Benung, where they're brought in and then just rejected. And, you know, they're essentially two tragic figures who have to recreate some sort of life for themselves, thrown together, not brothers, but actually thrown together as a pair, forever a pair, because of their shared, in, their, their shared you know, racial heritage. And then the, the almost brutal way that it's made clear to them that they have no place in the Australian landscape. The Noongar people are at home there their bodies are one with that country and these unfortunate young men, of course, it's emphasised that they are not in their country, wherever that might be. They're in a sense to me like they are the massive sort of tragedy of diasporic peoples. You know, if you, you're taken out of your country, who are you, where do you fit in, how do you find a place in a new country? It's to me, it's not a major part of the novel, but it certainly is powerful and troubling. Okay, it's, look, I've had this fantastic 10 events. Uh, I've learned a lot about Australian, his, Australian literature. It's been enormously fun for me, so I just wanted to say thank you for coming, and please thank Philip Morrissey for his contribution tonight. <laughs>